Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, keep summertime crops going and prep for fall with hands-on tips from the Sustainable Food Center. Get a few more insider tricks at Sunshine Community Gardens where good food and good friends get together. Daphne checks out moldy mulch and makes her pick of the week, and Trisha Shirey cools things down with tasty popsicles. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Good food and good friends, what more can you ask for? At Sunshine Community Gardens, you'll find lots of both. From its inception in the 1970s, Sunshine Community Gardens has put food on many a table while connecting urban folk to the root of its origins. Its mission is more important now than ever, a public space where people can come together to grow organic food. Basically our goal is to you can have as many people gardening as possible. I love gardening, I love growing vegetables, and where I live is too shaded. I knew I would have vegetables, but I, I never planned on the wonderful social experience. A lot of people tell me I do more talking around visiting than gardening, but that's part of community gardening is visiting and enjoying the company. It's a community of people that I've become friends with, and I hang out with them, talk to them, talk about cooking, talk basketball. Also, it's people who work in these buildings around here, they often come over and stroll through the garden at their lunch time or their coffee break time. I do the cooking in my family and the way to cook well is to control your ingredients. All the produce, any, everything we grow, it's so, so much better than anything you can get. Even, even the organic produce that you get at the store, this is so much fresher because it's literally just been picked an hour ago. Sunshine resides on land just west of Lamar, leased from the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. In their partnership, Sunshine Gardeners work with the students who now have their own plots. They're gonna use this as a teaching uh, strategy with their students. And they've just completed their own greenhouse, so they're gonna have a greenhouse where they're gonna propagate plants as well on their property. So that's a really nice uh, educational uh, fit that we have. Volunteers operate Sunshine Community Gardens, from executive decisions and maintenance to the website. We also did the MICA 6 food bank, which uh, has about 10 churches that have food banks, and we supply food to them on a weekly basis, twice a week. This nonprofit is supported by membership fees, sweat equity, and the annual plant sale held on the first Saturday of March. For decades, Sunshine has educated backyard gardeners about organic practices. Anyone is welcome to come by to see how food and flowers can be grown without herbicides, synthetic fertilizers, or pesticides. Good bugs help keep the bad bugs away, and I don't use a tiller on my garden. I just still do it the old shovel because I don't want to chew up all my worms. I've got a lot of good worms and good bacteria in the soil, and I use a lot of compost. Compost is the main ingredient behind the garden's abundance. Landscaper donations contribute mulch and carbon fuel to blend into the compost pile to balance the nitrogen from garden clippings and seasonal turnover. And we have people just drive in here or bicycle in here with their little bag and go over and they've saved all their peeling and scraps and put it on the compost pile. I had been sort of a failed tomato grower before and for the first time we're having really good um, production. It's the first time I've been growing vegetables in raised beds and using tons and tons of compost. At Sunshine, community builds knowledge where gardeners learn from each other. And I use this hay fork because the tines are thinner and more widely separated and reduces the possibility of digging right into a potato. There we go. Let's see what we have. Ah! Very nice. Ooh! These are about the biggest we've had so far. I've gotten much more from being here for three years, talking to other gardeners and seeing what they grow and understanding the climate than I would ever have gotten gardening in my backyard. It's also a testing ground. What variety works best? Randy Thompson and his wife, Janet Adams, experiment with tomatoes. 
you have to diversify your portfolio, so to speak, because you never know what the weather's going to do. And some years the heirlooms do really well, other years the hybrid. And one way of ensuring that you have a crop of some kind is to vary what you plant. And plus, I'm just a geek. I like to grow a bunch of different things. I'm growing a caper. Capers are native to the Mediterranean. They typically only get 17 inches of rain a year. And even in a drought year here in Central Texas, we're gonna get more than that. So I had to elevate it and provide better drainage. That's a secret too for finicky time. In composted raised beds framed by scavenged rocks, he's always got plenty to share. Jack McAvoy's technique unites summer corn and cucumbers. Cucumbers always get beat by the heat here. So we planted the corn in front of them on this side because of the way the sun travels through the day. And it will grow up and it will be a barrier for shade. And that way, hopefully, hopefully, the cucumbers will grow and not shrivel on the vine. Plots vary in size, but even the largest rely on crop rotation to assist plant health. Last year right there were the tomatoes and this year they're here. Next year they'll be over in that plot and then move up to the other plot and then three or four years later they'll be back down here so I just keep things moving around. I could leave it fallow or plant a, a cover crop like buckwheat or black eyed peas or I could put in beans. And of course uh, we'll probably follow that, uh, the tomatoes in the fall with lettuces and uh, kale and uh, maybe even carrots. Some people have to just about put tomatoes in the same spot, but you keep a healthy soil, a lot of compost, and a lot of worms and good bacteria in the soil. That's a big thing is keep healthy soil. Membership fees pay for water, but deeply composted and mulched beds retain moisture to conserve that resource. Sure, there are a few demon insects, but vigilance is a key factor to control them. I think gardening is kind of like you know, having a, having a baby, you gotta be committed to, <laughs> you can't just feed a baby and put it back in the crib. And <laughs> so you can't just water, you gotta go look at your garden. Above and below, you'll find the volunteers that naturally control insect problems. It's a neat place for a lot of other reasons other than gardening, and part of it is the wildlife that's at the community gardens. Mingling flowers with food is more than just pretty. They're a shout out for beneficial pollinators. And the pollination piece of it is really important. Right. You know, it's great to have flowers in your garden so you have pollination across your, across your vegetables too. So apart from the aesthetics, which are wonderful, they really are practical too. But you can't censor the wildlife who thanks you for your consideration. Just plant more and offer an alternative menu. Randy's sunflowers and water bowls are one strategy. I hope that by providing water to the birds, they're less likely to peck holes in my tomatoes, even though it still does happen. When purple martins return in midwinter, they patrol for flying insects. Robert Jerry constructed the chimney swift tower to attract these insect-loving endangered birds. He relied on George Ann and Paul Kyle's books to get him started. I'm in charge of the carpentry, so uh, I, I like woodworking. Volunteers constructed the greenhouses where carefully selected seeds, along with donated transplants from Gabriel Valley Farms, grow up for the public plant sale the first weekend of March. Volunteers like Nancy Seibert chair the primary fundraiser where backyard gardeners can pick up the best performers. I seek out input of what did well, what didn't do well, so that when we have things, there's a reasonable hope that they will produce in Central Texas. More than just food, Sunshine Community Gardens is actually another urban park and wildlife refuge between buildings and asphalt. I think we need more green space all around. I think it's great for the neighborhood to have a spot that is growing plants and is an organic spot. And it's also like a release for people that live in the city to be able to garden and be with other gardeners. I think it's just a really wonderful place for people to come that are city dwellers. Always enjoy seeing community gardens at work. So much joy there and so much community actually taking place in the garden setting. So thanks for opening the gates for us. Right now we're going to be talking about getting ready for fall and dealing with summer in the, in the vegetable garden. And we're joined by a special guest, Sari Albornoz from uh, the Sustainable Food Center. And uh, welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And uh, congratulations to the Sustainable Food Center. You've just moved into brand new facilities and have a brand new garden. 
And uh, a lot of our uh, listeners out there are in the same boat, brand new gardens, uh, or people who are trying vegetable gardening for the first time. And I understand at your new garden site in East Austin, you have some particular challenges. We do. It's very unusual. Um, so first of all, we're very excited that we have a new space. Right. Um, we've existed for a long time without having um, our very own garden. Um, mm -hmm. And so we can't wait to get started. Um, right. But we do have strange soil. Um, the site where the garden is going to be situated used to be um, a brick company. And so they would stage lots of materials that they used to make the bricks, um, mm -hmm. including a lot of sand. So um, really unusual for East Austin, we have sandy soil to deal with. Okay, well that is unusual because, you know, most of us on the east side uh, have clay soils. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, we all have some problems to deal with, right? So what is the response to the sandy soil situation that you're working with? So the refrain has been lots and lots and lots of compost, <laughs> lots of organic material. Right. Um, and we're also not going to just evenly distribute organic material throughout the entire area mm -hmm. because that would be a ton of compost. Oh, so yes. we're going to be building up some, so um, kind of doing some lasagna gardening in some spaces. Um, we'll be doing raised beds in some spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll also, we will be enriching the soil um, in some spaces with lots of organic material because okay. um, we'll have great drainage and once we get the microbial activity going, Right. and the um, kind of substance started, then um, I think we'll be good. Well, I think some people in these cells might want to borrow some of your sand <laughs> to help with that drainage question. Maybe so. Maybe we have extra. But you use the phrase lasagna garden, and there are going to be a lot of people out there going, lasagna garden. Does that mean they're growing pasta and cheese? <laughs> Could what, be. It's layering. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the, so d describe that technique for us. Sure. So it's kind of like sheet composting. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you can start out by putting um, cardboard down if mm -hmm. you've got um, a Bermuda grass situation or other weeds situation, yes, um, yeah. cover with nice thick layer, and then mm. um, add the vegetable scraps, mm -hmm. um, add lots of leaves, and just kind of layer that way. So you're essentially composting right there um, mm -hmm. where your garden is going to be and building the soil um, right, right there. I so. think that's a great technique, actually. I love sheet composting. It's a, it's a, a very practical thing to do in the garden, mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. that's a great tip for just about everybody, really. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we are. You're starting this new garden in the heat of the summer. There are a lot mm -hmm. of other people out there suffering uh, through the same uh, extreme uh, weather conditions here that we all have in Central Texas. What are, well, I want to focus on some survival tips, so some sure. basic things that, some, that can be employed in the garden at this time of year. Mm -hmm. Sure. I know a lot of people are prepping the soil for the fall vegetable garden, but a lot of people are still trying to nurse along plants from the spring. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what, what would you do in that situation? So I think the most important thing is um, mulch. Um, mm -hmm. Mulch is just a savior as far as um, regulating the temperature of the soil, um, minimizing evaporation. So you can use um, wood chips as mulch. You can also just use leaves that you have collected. Um, you can use uh, pine needles if you have them. You can use um, straw. Um, just basically anything that creates a nice blanket to protect the soil. Um, and then also making sure you're watering um, deeply, um, not necessarily just a little bit every day, um, but just deeply and infrequently um, just to make sure that you're keeping the soil um, moist at a regular temperature um, and just kind of keeping those plants happy. Well, you know what I like to do, and in, in, in whether it's a vegetable garden or ornamental garden, is exactly what you talked about with the watering. Good, deep, infrequent waterings. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the gardener in me can't resist doing something when I'm out there. Right. So in, I, uh, sometimes what I'll do is just kind of wash the plants off sometimes in the morning. Mm -hmm. And they take in water through the foliage, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. it, that combination of Frequent but extremely light, just washing the foliage mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. with the uh, deep watering seems to work really, really well. It makes sense just to kind of cool them off. Cool them off, wash mm -hmm. them off, knock a few of the bugs off, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, what about shading? Shading. So um, there's lots of cool techniques for shading. You can trellis. Um, mm -hmm. And in the summer, we're growing beans. Um, you might yeah. have kind of a, a, sh a shade structure created out of a trellis that has beans growing on it. Right. Um, you can also do um, kind of cool shapes of of um, trellising like a, a teepee trellis where you have, mm -hmm. you can just use bamboo and have it intersect at the top and mm -hmm. um, have it kind of supported at the bottom, either using um, PVC or rebar to um, fortify it. Um, and that's a cool trellis. You can even use fencing kind of strategically. I mean, you would have already done this by this point, but strategically plant in a way that um, you have a, a fence next to it that you can trellis something up um, mm -hmm. to pro provide a little bit of shade. And then also just shade cloth. Right. Um, so you can, um, in our citizen gardener classes that we teach at SFC, um, 
we'll, um, we pe teach people how to create little um, hoop houses on their 4x4 four four beds um, right. with um, PVC. And you can just lay a little shade cloth right on top of that, um, kind of situate it strategically so it's blocking maybe the really strong um, west afternoon sun and then um, give your plants a little relief that way. Yeah, and I think that's a, an incredibly smart thing to do and I think it's being really widely adopted now, that whole thing about just, and very simply, using PVC in an arch over mm -hmm. the bed Mm -hmm. makes it very easy to drape the shade cloth overhead. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a really smart technique. Now for those who are preparing for the fall vegetable garden, let's talk about the soil preparation for that. Uh, lots of compost I know, but mm -hmm. what, what it, let's just talk about raised beds. Sure. Um, so do you mean like constructing raised beds sure. from scratch? Let's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, you can, if, <clears throat> if you were wanting to start a little garden in the fall from scratch and you've got a raised bed in mind, um, you might have weeds to start out with. Mm -hmm. So you can either dig out all those weeds or you can solarize. Um, so that means putting plastic on top right. um, and letting um, the sun kind of help you cook those weeds. Right. And then they're pretty easy to take out. Um, or you can take a shortcut, um, which is just putting cardboard, um, which does biodegrade, in a really mm -hmm. thick layer with no gaps over, and then you can build your raised bed right on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can use different materials for the bed. You can use wood. Um, cedar is really great because um, it holds up. It doesn't break down as quickly. Right. Um, and you can also use um, composite decking, which mm -hmm. is um, a synthetic substance, but right. it holds up pretty well, too. Right. It doesn't um, have the preservatives that a lot of wood, treated right, woods exactly. have. Exactly. So right. avoiding treated wood is really important because mm -hmm. that's going to leach toxins into the right. veggie, veggie cultivating soil, which you right. don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And you can also use things like limestone, yeah. um, which can look really attractive and provide a place to sit. You're right, right. I like so. the limestone beds. A lot of plants don't like the limestone so much, but um, a lot of them will uh, mm -hmm. do just fine with a little yeah. bit of limestone along the periphery. So. It's true. We've got basic soil already. Right, so. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think the raised bed is a great thing for this especially for this person who's really beginning to garden mm -hmm. because I think you have a lot more success that way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and it also you can control the soil more you can bring in uh, the compost and the granite sand and all the different things that you mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. and, and a really nice blend of materials there typically what do you recommend in terms of that blend? Everybody has their favorite recipes. <laughs> well, I mean, making sure it has good enough drainage, so you want to make sure it has a sand component to it, mm -hmm. um, making sure that um, it's got enough organic material, um, so making sure there's compost in it. Right. I think that there are some good gardening mixes that are um, that are available for vegetable gardening at, right. you know, at nurseries around mm -hmm. town. So um, I don't have a specific favorite, okay. but um, just kind of making sure there's a good balance there. Okay. Real briefly, let's talk about harvesting because sure. a lot of people uh, are, are still harvesting. Mm -hmm. um, any, anything that you'd like to pass along there? Um, about harvesting, um, well, um, can you be a little bit more specific? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say in terms of utilization of the foods and, and preserving. Oh, yeah. cool. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, that, that segues nicely into a recipe I wanted to highlight okay. um, from the Happy Kitchen, which is our cooking and nutrition program. Um, if you're harvesting a lot of cucumbers right now, um, you can um, make a nice Thai cucumber salad mm -hmm. that... Um, is just some onions and chili paste and mint, and you can get mint from the garden and mix it all together with a cucumber, and we've got a recipe in there um, that goes into more detail, but that's delicious. You can also, um, if you've got a lot of okra, you can pickle it, you can pickle the cucumbers, so yeah. I hope a lot of people out there will go to your website to get mm -hmm. the recipes, mm -hmm. learn more about the Sustainable Food Center, and also visit you in your brand new location. So thank you, Sari, so much sure, for coming yeah. on Sure, yeah, thanks board. for having me. Okay, great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our question this week is from Mary, who's concerned about her mulch. She has a couple of bags of cedar mulch that have been stored outside since last year, and now there's mold growing in the bag. Is the mulch safe to use in a garden bed? Well, Mary, you should separate out the moldy portion and toss it in your compost pile, and the rest is safe to use. The moist environment in the bag, with all that yummy, dead organic matter, is the perfect place for mold and other fungal spores to take root. You don't want to use the moldy mulch in your garden, simply because it would serve as a source of spores for the colony to spread. But the mold is feeding on dead tissue, not living. So unless the bed was kept far too wet, the mulch wouldn't damage your plants. In fact, there are dormant mold spores just about everywhere, just waiting for the situation to be right so they can germinate and grow. 
But take away the environmental problems, such as too much moisture, and the colony will die out quickly. Soil is actually teeming with many different species of microbes, most of which pose no threat to normal plant life and even help improve it by breaking down dead organic matter and converting it to life-giving nutrients. So when you toss the moldy mulch into your compost pile, other microbes get involved in the process and continue the job of breaking those wood chips down into smaller and smaller pieces until you have rich, humic compost to add back to your soil. So Mary, if you find that the mold is widespread throughout the bag, or if you just want to err on the side of caution, you should simply cut the whole bag into your compost pile and let nature run its course. To continue with our edible theme, this week's plant is okra, which is a fabulous plant for Central Texas gardens. Okra thrives in the heat and is actually quite beautiful, so consider using it as a specimen plant in the landscape. Like most of our warm season vegetables, okra may be planted as both a spring and fall crop. But fall here doesn't equate to what most of us think of as fall. Here in Central Texas, we must plant our fall gardens in late July or August, since you'll need to plant in summer in order to reap a harvest in the fall. There are many great cultivars of okra to choose from, but one of my favorites is burgundy, which as its name implies, has deep burgundy fruits and even quite a bit of burgundy color in the leaves and stems. Okra requires full sun and minimal water, so very little supplemental irrigation is needed but if you water at least once a week, you'll get a lot better harvest. An area with well-drained soil is best, and if you're preparing a new area, it's a good idea to incorporate about an inch of compost to the bed. As the compost breaks down over time, it improves the structure of the soil and adds a small amount of nutrients slowly. Okra will also benefit from a little fertilizer, which you can add after the first harvest to ensure that the plant has plenty of nutrients to produce more fruit. Okra gets very tall, so they need plenty of soil depth to anchor themselves. In shallow, rocky soils, they may fall over. So give each plant about a foot on each side to fill in. This fairly narrow width and taller height might make okra a nice addition to a spot where you've had winter annuals that have now died back. For a list of okra and other vegetable cultivars, visit our Travis County Extension website. And if you'd like to learn more about fall vegetable garden, consider signing up for a class on August 8th. More information about that on centraltexashorticulture.blogspot.com. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions and plants of the week. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey. Popsicles are a great treat in the summertime, but a lot of the popsicles that you buy may have artificial colors, flavors, and high fructose corn syrup that you want to avoid but they're really easy to make. Now you can buy popsicle molds in many different shapes and sizes. I'd look for some that are BPA free plastic. But if you don't have popsicle molds, you can use cups or with uh, sticks, spoons, and aluminum foil. I just make a tiny slit in the aluminum foil and you can put the stick, uh, spoon, or even a chopstick right through the foil. You can write the name of the popsicle, the type of popsicle on the foil, and then put that in your freezer. Now it is nice to put your molds in a uh, pan or a bowl of some kind that's going to keep them upright in the freezer until they're frozen and then once they're frozen you can put them in warm water for a few seconds or hold them in your hands on a hot day to unmold them and uh, once you have them frozen you may want to take them out of the molds and put them in a plastic bag or wrap them up to protect the flavor from other th things in the freezer. Now you can really vary the ingredients in these. You can use yogurt or milk or cream and depending on the high fat content and the uh, dairy products you'll have a creamier texture with a higher fat product like cream uh, but you can still have a great popsicle even with a 2% milk. You can use fresh fruit from your garden or frozen fruit and it's a great way to use up some of that fruit that you have that everyone's kind of tired of and, and or that watermelon that uh, everyone's grown tired of. Make some watermelon berry popsicles. I like to add mint, basil, lemon verbena uh, to them. You can sweeten with stevia, honey, agave nectar, or organic sugar. Now, I've got lots of recipes on the CTG website, and that's klru.org slash CTG. Um, some of my favorites are the watermelon berry. This is strawberries with mint, watermelon, sometimes I'll put basil. I love the avocado creamsicle. It sounds strange, but it's really, really good. 
I make a tropical popsicle with mango and pineapple, and I uh, flavor the pineapple juice with lemon verbena and pineapple sage. I love to take leftover coffee, mix it with milk or some chai tea, and make a coffee pop. Great uh, afternoon refresher. I like to take green tea and peppermint, sweeten it with stevia, and that's a really wonderful ice pop as well. Yogurt and berries of all kinds. Use a cherries with a vanilla yogurt. Um, I'll take pineapple and put that with coconut yogurt. And uh, you can really vary the flavors and make your own combinations. That's what's really fun about this. You can really come up with your own combinations. One that I really love is taking Thai lime leaves, mixing it with coconut milk, so you put the lime leaves in the coconut and you let it sit overnight and then you freeze that into a popsicle and coconut lime popsicles, they're really something you'll enjoy. So I hope you'll try some of these popsicle recipes and uh, enjoy them with your friends and family and neighbors. For Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shari. Thanks for watching. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and join us on Facebook too. Next week, get creative with succulent designs. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.